everyone. Uh, appreciate your participation in this session. Uh, the title of the session is Can Online Platforms Facilitate Locally Led Development? Um, and we have a great group of panelists to discuss this with us today and you know ask questions of and ask questions uh, answer your questions as well so uh, feel free to introduce yourself in the the chat let folks know where you're joining from uh, you know what beverage you're you're drinking at this point of day so good morning good evening good afternoon wherever you are around the world uh, and I guess we'll just jump into it we've got uh, uh, a limited amount of time and a lot to, to cover. So my name is Zachary Bakke. I'm the strategy and learning advisor and learning team lead within the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security with USAID. And so I've been working with USAID for 13 years around knowledge management, development of learning platforms, uh, knowledge and sharing, and how to build community around those things in order to make knowledge sharing more effective. So we're going to be talking uh, or focusing a little bit on AgriLinks, uh, this sort of knowledge sharing platform around food security and agriculture that uh, USAID has been supporting for the past uh, 10 years. And AgriLinks was created um, primarily as a way to share uh, the recordings of events. And so that really was the, the genesis for it. So way back when we had started a sort of a knowledge sharing seminar and it was really internal to USAID, uh, 20 people, 30 people max. Uh, I decided to start you know, expanding that audience to really be able to allow as many people as possible to, to join in. And so you know, I moved it into a space that allowed for others to, to join the meeting outside of USAID staff. And then you know, at the time, webinars were kind of a, a newer thing. So I started to have webinars and then we would do recordings of those webinars to be able to share those out. And we wanted to be able to allow others to have access to it on, online. And so AgriLinks sort of initially became a way to have others access those events, be able to participate as well as to, you know, access the, the recordings. And so that really began that kind of process of AgriLinks' growth and really starting to uh, expand the kind of knowledge sharing and activities that we would do. And so we see these online activities as really key to building a, a global community um, and really starting to connect different stakeholders with one another such that they have the opportunity to share knowledge with one another as well as ask uh, questions and sort of engage with uh, experts. And so we've used it from for a variety of reasons, uh, reasons uh, from expanding uh, just our knowledge sharing, you know, through the webinars, but then also to provide an opportunity to get feedback from uh, stakeholders, you know, through online discussions. And so one of our bigger online discussions was really to uh, inform the Feed the Future research strategy, you know, a, a few years ago. And so we had an online ongoing discussion and sort of those, that feedback was actually incorporated into the, the strategy. And so we see this as kind of a key platform for engaging a wide range of, of stakeholders. And just to give you a kind of a quick overview of uh, AgriLinks and you know, the audience, you know, we have visitors from all across the globe. Um, you can be a member of AgriLinks, which allows you to you know, post materials, events, and the like. And so there's 14,000 members currently with AgriLinks. You don't necessarily have to be a member of AgriLinks to access the content or to get updates. And so the newsletter itself has 27,000 uh, followers um, from around the globe. And what we've seen is you know, a lot of increase in interest uh, with AgriLinks. So we've got 1.2 million page views uh, in the past year, uh, and then sort of 285,000 new users. You know, our blogs have become a popular thing. Originally, it used to be only the events, but those have become uh, a greater thing. And we're, you know, 
truly having uh, a wide variety of folks. We have USAID staff, we have foreign government staff, uh, people from agribusiness, um, implementing partners, NGOs, researchers, scientists, entrepreneurs, and the like. So all across our different platforms, both uh, the AgriLinks platform itself, but then the various sort of uh, multi, uh, social media as well. So our, our LinkedIn channel, which we just launched recently, Twitter, uh, you know, Facebook, and our newsletter. So um, those are a variety of ways that we kind of engage. And I think we are trying to expand and look into new ways such that uh, we can connect with a variety of audiences from around the globe. And with that, what we're doing today is talking to a variety of different stakeholders and how they've engaged with uh, AgriLinks and you know how they see the use of the online platform for locally led development. And with that, it's my pleasure to, to introduce our panelists and then I will hand it over to them to do some uh, brief um, introductions of themselves and talk about their involvement with AgriLinks and how they see the use of online uh, communities impacting their work. And so I'll just kind of give the list of uh, panelists. So our first will be Dr. Catherine Nakalembe, uh, who's Associate Research Professor uh, at the University of Maryland and Program Director of NASA Harvest. Uh, next, we'll have uh, Ekin <laughs> Minkpong Ben, uh, Founder, CEO of Elkanis and Partners. Uh, next, we'll have Jean-Claude Rubiogo, uh, leader, Global Bean Program, Alliance of Biodiversity International and SEAT, uh, Director of Pan-African Bean Research Alliance. And then we'll have Kirsten Johnson, Team Leader of the Famine Early Warning Systems Network or FuseNet uh, Management Team with the USAID Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. And with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Dr. Catherine Nakalembe. Uh uh, good day, everybody. Um, uh, my name is uh, Catherine Akalembe. I'm an associate research professor at the University of Maryland in the Department of Geographic Sciences. And uh, um, uh, under the NASA Harvest Program, I lead our Africa program, so coordinating and, and um, managing as well as advancing some of the work that we're doing towards agriculture monitoring with uh, satellite data. Um, we use a lot of um, digital technology in our work. It's sort of uh, kind of a core component or the defining component. Uh, we use uh, satellite earth observations. We use uh, machine learning. So we are heavy on data processing and, uh, um, and analysis, but some of our methods rely heavily on uh, collecting ground data where um, ICT tools uh, for collecting ground truth are absolutely um, necessary um, part of our work also, um, you know, has a strong emphasis on working with end user and stakeholders and trying to make sure that they can access. So depending on the end user that they can access the tools. Um, for example, if we have a data product on uh, crop conditions, um, you know, this might be best displayed in a web GIS uh, platform. If you were trying to communicate with a farmer, for example, for a, a certain use case, perhaps you might want to go with text messaging rather than having a, a bulletin. And um, if you're trying to coordinate with um, with um, extension agents who are in the field, uh, one of the tools, for example, could be WhatsApp. And so there's there's definitely plenty of things that we um, uh, you know that benefit and uh, make uh, some of our work possible. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here and be a part of this panel. We'll hand it over to our next speaker. All right, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear you clearly. All right, Excellent. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everybody listening to us and joining us. Uh, my name is Kanekbong Ben. I'm the CEO of El Kenis and Partners here in Nigeria. I'm a professional engineer with uh, over 16 years experience in strategy and operations and management. I've always been passionate about finding smart ways to support farmers while building a sustainable and a profitable food sector. However, this led me to the establishment of Elkanis, a company that believes in innovation 
in agriculture uh, could be a central driving force to achieving a Nigeria free from hunger and mal malnutrition. So here at Elkanis, we are a food production company and agricultural support uh, service company. I believe uh, integrating digital platforms to the agricultural sector will be the key to Africa's food secure future. Uh, however, I began working with digital platforms uh, in 2010 when I deployed a simple Microsoft Office platform to run my poultry farm. Uh, this actually helped me reduce waste while uh, doubling my income. And now we've moved to working with drones, IVRs, mobile apps, IOTs, et cetera. So when I talk about drones, we have a drone that can map your farm and uh, give you a kind of yield prediction, also do a soil analysis for you, tells you where specifically your, your soil is deficient of nutrients. You know, in a way, it supports farmers in improving their yield and also increasing their income. So we also have our IVRs, that's an interactive voice response. You know, we discovered that most of the farmers in the rural areas are not on smartphones. So, but uh, about 90 to 95% of them, they actually own phones. So what we did was to develop an IVR, which in the course of this discussion will expand more on how this is uh, affecting positively the farmers. So they have a particular number where they call and uh, it routes them to an extension agent, to an input supplier, to even government uh, extension and service uh, support service providers. We also have mobile apps that support those in the urban, mostly the young that are ready and willing to move into agriculture. We also have IOTs as the internet of things that support farmers, also support farms to know, uh, it triggers sprinklers and the rest. Um, I'm here to reflect on the journey, share the lessons learned while looking forward to a robust engagement on how online platforms can facilitate locally led development. Thank you. Uh, I'm expecting to have a nice discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, uh, Jean Claude. <clears throat> uh, thanks, thanks, Zachary. Yeah, so Jean Claude Rubiogo, I'm the leader of the Global Bean Program. Uh, of the Alliance of Biodiversity International and CIAT, one uh, so it's member of the one CJR, uh, which is a group on, on agriculture, international agricultural research uh, uh, globally. We do work on several commodities, uh, and one of them is beans, uh, the common beans, uh, which you can see down there on my screen uh, through the Pan African Bean Research Alliance. That means uh, it's an it's African-owned organization, uh, which is an alliance between the BIN program, uh, which I'm the leader, the Global BIN program, which works on two continents, uh, Americas and Africa. But, and then with, together with the 31 National Agricultural Research Organization in Africa, uh, from East uh, and Southern Africa and West Africa, as you can see from that map on the far uh, uh, right down. Uh, so also engaging with um, members of the value chain actors, that means in the 31 countries, we have uh, been processors, we have been traders, we have farmers, farmer organizations who are using beans to improve nutrition, to improve incomes, uh, agroecosystems, to make sure that at least the, their families, the, the, the consumers have the right product. So we also, it's a, it's, it's a mat donor supported by various organizations, including USAID, Global Affairs Canada, uh, Swiss Development Cooper uh, Agency for Cooperation. We also have uh, uh, BMGF as well, and ICR in several African government as that one countries uh, contribute and value chain actors as well. So we work along the value chain, uh, that means we look at the consumer, what, what interests them in terms of consuming beans, beans uh, with the different color, different shape, different tastes, some without uh, any other problem of flatulence. And then from the consumer demand, uh, we go and develop the varieties which the consumers are, are interested in. And we, we, we develop a seed system to so get these varieties in the hands of the farmer. And this is done in collaboration and co-creation with the national research institutions who deliver these varieties to either small city producers or companies to, to commercialize the, the seed. And then the grain market is 
through the aggregation is done by value chain actors, the traders, and then taken to the consumption, including the processes. So we have a value chain approach. This requires a lot of communication. As we develop the various products, you need to engage with the, with the value chain actors, get their feedback. We also work with the various other organizations, not only the national program and value chain actors, we work with other CG members, we work with the universities. So we have a different uh, initiative together. This requires a lot of communication, exchange of information, research products, uh, so that people can take them and commercialize them, improve their nutrition and incomes. Uh, we also have high, high, uh, high level research, uh, again, where we look at the different uh, quality of, of the, the beans, different varieties, climate smart. So that requires a lot of uh, uh, really communication and engagement so that you develop the right products and people have the right information so that they can really commercialize. So for us, uh, this is an opportunity. We have been also uh, sharing our research findings through AgriLink. So we really appreciate uh, uh, having this platform. We've been able even to produce a recently a very good webinar on yellow beans, which uh, was really highly uh, facilitated by, again, AgriLinks. And, and we produced a video, we really received a good, good feedback from, from people who participated in these discussions. So yeah, I'd be really willing and ready to share information that we have. Otherwise, thanks for your participation and giving us this opportunity as well. I wish you, all of you good participation. Great, thank you. And next it's uh, Kirsten. Have we lost Kirsten? If you're speaking, you're on mute. Um, it seems uh, Kirsten might have jumped up. Kirsten is having some technical difficulties. Uh, can't unmute myself. Uh, hold on. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Sorry for the the technical challenge. Um, uh, it's such a pleasure to be here today with everyone. Um, let's see, and um, I, it's fantastic to be here with such inspiring colleagues, both here on the panel and in the audience. And I just want to thank everyone first for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Kirsten Johnson, and um, I serve as team leader on the Famine Early Warning Systems Network, as you see there on the slide. Um, Fusenet forecasts acute food insecurity in the world's most vulnerable countries, um, which in turn helps USAID to deliver humanitarian assistance to save lives. Um, so that's, that's kind of uh, what I do right now. Um, and how does that kind of relate to AgriLinks? Um, one of my favorite ways to engage with AgriLinks um, has actually been through AgriLinks monthly theme on earth observations for food security and agriculture. Um, and so with these monthly themes, uh, multiple blog posts on the topic are published by members of the community. Um, a webinar is hosted by our AgriLinks colleagues. And what this does is really help stimulate conversation about the topic. Um, for uh, this particular topic on earth observations for food security and ag, um, I really felt like we needed this monthly theme um, and AgriLinks was a perfect um, kind of platform for that. Um, I noticed that USAID had really important information needs that could be met with satellite data. Um, and we were using those data in some instances but we could really benefit more if we could use them systematically. Um, so questions that I had were, you know, how do we help increase the use of these data? Um, how do we make the data feel accessible to people who care, to all the people who care about agriculture and food security, everywhere from the farmer's fields all the way to offices in Washington, DC? Um, how do we connect the people who have information needs to those scientists who are working with these data every day, like, like Catherine here. 
um, uh, who are the, the folks who can really help meet those information needs, if they have the conversation with the decision makers to understand what kinds of questions that they have um, and that they need answers to. And so again, AgriLinks is really perfect for this because it helped to facilitate a community conversation. Um, so working with scientists at NASA Harvest, Servere, FuseNet, um, the Climate Hazard Center, Stanford, and others, and we've been able to use that monthly theme on AgriLinks to translate um, the remote sensing science into information that people can actually use, um, you know, for their work uh, all along, um, all along the, the line from, from kind of the fields to uh, decision making. Um, so um, really appreciate the forum that AgriLinks provides for us to be able to have that kind of community conversation. Um, in terms of how online communities have impacted my work, you know, in addition to the great role that AgriLinks has served, um, I can give another example uh, from a different platform, Twitter. Um, right now, uh, many of you may know that the Eastern Horn of Africa is experiencing an exceptional three season drought um, that unfortunately may uh, extend to an unprecedented four seasons of drought. Um, it's already a very severe uh, humanitarian emergency. Um, in the middle of this drought, there was a cold snap with really heavy rains. Um, and as a result of that, uh, there was widespread death of tens of thousands of sheep and goats in Marsabit County in northern Kenya. Maybe other counties were affected as well. And uh, to me, this was really shocking. It's a huge loss of food and livelihoods. And I mean, I had a question. I wanted to know how common is this, this kind of phenomenon? Is this something that we should be anticipating as part of our food insecurity forecasting? Um, so I didn't know. I put the question out there to the Twitter community and colleagues in Kenya immediately wrote back to say, yes, you know, animals are really weakened after a long drought. And then when they're hit by the rain and the cold, they just can't survive. Um, so it's something that happens after long droughts. Um, for me, I was, I didn't know. And this information was really helpful for me to understand. Um, and it may be helpful in improving our ability to forecast acute food insecurity. So having these platforms that allow people who care about these issues to really exchange information and knowledge and learning, I think it, it really advances um, and, and helps us all do better work. Um, so uh, thanks again uh, for the opportunity and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, thanks all of our panelists for giving us the kind of the opening preview and their thoughts on online platforms. Uh, I would like to start the discussion. I'm going to throw, you know, put one question to the to the panel. Um, what types of information and engagement drive innovation and results? Perhaps we could start with you, Catherine. What types of information and engagement? Um, I think it depends on, um, it depends on the level. Um, so if it is a, a decision-making process, um, for example, if you're um, your stakeholder or the organization uh, that you're trying to reach is a, a decision-maker, At that level, um, very detailed, um, overly complex, uh, thinking about you know, an academic publication or, um, or something written in very technical language might not be the most appropriate. Um, and so in this case, you know, you're looking at very simplified and you know, that is a double-edged sword because when you oversimplify, sometimes some things cannot be really overly simplified. So like a, a good balance, some kind of balance um, is, is, is important. So distilled um, with the key messages, I think is important. Um, and then with supporting evidence, of course, and descriptions of all the, uh, those things I think is important. But you know, for the general public, you know, going back to Kirsten's uh, point, um, 
from before is having um, something that is descriptive um, with key facts translated or um, communicated in, a, in an accessible way becomes important. So still not, it's not the same as what you would provide for a policymaker. Maybe the policymaker would also read that, but you need to make it a kind of a, a more accessible. So bringing things to the ground, I think becomes important. So actual examples, um, you know, there say that pictures, uh, speak a million words. So when you describe, um, as Kirsten was, was describing this drought, for example, that's happening, um, some people might miss, you know, how critical it is. But with an image, with a video, we can see kind of the power of all of those things right now uh, with platforms like TikTok and, 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 and whatever. It can send the message. Um, it can send the message out. But also, of course, that has a whole bunch of other issues with that. Yeah. Thanks. Um, any other member of the panel want to uh, put their thoughts in on, you know, the types of information and engagement that drive innovation and results through online platforms? Hello. If hello, yes. Hello. Yeah. Okay. Contributing to that, uh, factual information could also be uh, uh, factual information that solely deals with facts and real time happenings, example, climate change and its impact on food uh, production. So those are the kind of information that could drive engagement and innovation and results. So for example, uh, just like uh, what uh, uh, one of the uh, speakers said, you have issues that uh, has to do with climate change. You have issues, for example, COVID that came up and uh, those are the kind of information that could drive engagement and drive results. There is COVID, there is restriction in movement and government are putting up a lot of uh, restrictions. People can't move, farmers can't buy seeds, they can't buy fertilizer, they can't buy livestock feed for their, uh, for their livestock. And you're coming up with an engagement on possible ways on how uh, to, to go around uh, systems or big issues that is kind of limiting farmers. You know, it will be of interest to farmers. So if it's factual, if you have information that is factual, that has to do with their present need, uh, it, it, it kind of drives innovation and also brings results. Also, such information should be objective, which is understood from multiple viewpoints and uh, present all sides of an argument. It should, it should be very objective. It should uh, present from all angles. There should be uh, there should be feedback from audience. There should be feedback from users. Uh, in, in as a matter of fact. We should be aware whereby we, we, we also get information from, from the users, from those we are passing the information to. How is this uh, information of use to you? How is it of use to your business? How is it of use to your means of livelihood? So we, we look at that uh, information. It should be very factual and also uh, driven uh, objectively. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, making sure that the, that uh, it's information that folks can use. That's kind of a, a key piece of um, of driving their engagement because you know what would be the reason for them to come otherwise. Uh, and so, sort of thinking about that, uh, providing that type of information, you know, how can online or other ways that online platforms can empower local partners? Um, part of it has been you know raised as having that. Um, key information, you know, useful information for um, for day to day work. Uh, what are some of the other ways that uh, the panels can think of online pl platforms empowering local partners? May I take that, uh, if you don't mind? Sure, please. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's very important. Like just maybe I'll be using the example of the Pan-African Bean Research Alliance and the bean and the bin program of the Alliance of Biodiversity International in Sierra. So let's say like our organization is a member membership organization. So, so keep that, which as I said, it has researchers, it has the value chain actors, it has development partners involved in extension because you want to increase productivity, supplies, and get the right product in the consumer. It has a consumer because also the consumer needs need to be informed. It's maybe a platform. Uh, along the value chain. So for this then, uh, now as my other colleague was saying, 
in order to keep that one, even if we didn't have a COVID, you really need interactions, you need updates, you need engagement, you need the members need to know each other, what the members have. So in this regard, a platform online is ideal, digitalize that platform, that platform. And the digitalization can use several means, uh, several platform uh, from WhatsApp to others, maybe we'll talk about later. But this one allows them to access technology easily. Uh, and then once, once they are packaged, they, either a farmer will be able to know which variety is suitable to the area. Now you can send the photos and various other means and information. It's now online. So extension services, they are empowered to get the right information, the right uh, technological information, extension services. Farmers can send the, the photos of the disease plant and people can, can, help, can give them uh, information on how to, to, to control it, to protect it. Those who have a product can always, again, link with others who need it. So without necessarily in the past, that was not possible. So the traders can easily know where to source the product. People will be having WhatsApp groups uh, in the country or depending of their interest. And they will say, well, uh, who need, I have this, who need it? The other one will say, well, go off, uh, not on this platform, get me, and then we can interact. So it allows, this is really very, very important. So that again, it also access may be different from demogra various demographies, the youth um, or the women or men, or uh, that's another area probably need to look at it, the, the demographic divide, but in generally, uh, the online empowers the community, uh, allow, allow them to be together, sharing for us as researchers, how do we get the products to the users? It's through online more than anything else, it's more effective uh, than it used in the past where we could print and people get hard copies or, or uh, wait for the meetings, physical meeting to meet. So there's a lot of really engagement and sensitization of people is very easy. Uh, videos, animations, which again can empower farmers to see how you can give them all extension services to the, the videos and they will be able to follow up in their groups. It's easy also in such a way that they say work with the farmer organizations. Not everyone has to get this, uh, uh, the, they say the phones with the smartphones. The groups can have or two individuals who have them, they will be able to share. So there's really a lot of empowerment of the, the local community. Uh, also, it can empower even the local management uh, because people can easily be together and can easily share and update each other and very fast uh, without necessarily waiting for the, the, uh, uh, the physical, the way it used to be. So it's very, very relevant, but we need to be aware of probably uh, the divide which may happen because we find that probably more men have access to virtual phone to, to smartphone than women, but that's something again, uh, we need to be aware, but it happened that it's better than it used to be. Youth are more in, in this gadget and there are several. So there's a really very good uh, way we can say the communication has improved and the past and, and it really is not just a communication, it also empowers them in terms of knowledge, in terms of accessing information where to get the products, to get the research products, and it has been very helpful. Excellent, thank you. Um, other members of the the panel thinking about how uh, online platforms empower local partners, uh, either through your experiences or uh, through experiences you've heard of. Hello. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, online platforms are also been a veritable tool in supporting local partners, uh, not just local partners, those in the rural, using that word local, but even those in the urban too. Uh, we, we've also seen uh, online platforms being a, a tool whereby uh, partners have been able to get access to information like enabling the business of agriculture, the EBA index, which assesses laws and regulations in agriculture. You know, information like this could empower partners with data, data sets to identify actionable reforms to remove obstacles for farmers seeking to grow their business. Also, uh, we've seen WhatsApp being explored in a very positive 
ways and also in 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 quotes negative ways uh starting from the negative how uh online platform like whatsapp you know most of these uh, input suppliers they form groups they have groups where they belong to on the uh, whatsapp whereby uh they can just pick up their phones or one person will say okay today we are going to increase uh our feed in say x amount and uh, all of them will will agree to that meanwhile it's a kind of uh, in quotes cheating you know uh they, they exploit uh, farmers in a way and uh, you get to shop A and they tell you, oh, this feed is maybe $5. You move to the next shop, you, they tell you it's $5. You move to the next shop, they tell you it's $5. So you, you are kind of locked up. You don't have an option because uh, that platform has provided them an, an opportunity for them to, to communicate uh, uh, in, in the same sequence so that you're closed up. Nobody sells below the agreed price on the platform. So it's been a way of locking up farmers uh, with such, you know, that's on kind of on a negative part. You know, at times it might just come up, it might come up from an exploitative mindset that someone will just wake up and say, okay, I'm going to change the price of this product, I'm going to change the price of this input, and all of them buy suit because it favors them, it's giving them multiple profits. So that's on one part. Then on the other part, farmers have also been able to explore uh, platforms for their own advantage, for example, also market, market pricing. You know, farmers have been able to, to use these platforms to fix their prices, you know, whereas uh, middlemen and uh, some off-takers will get to the rural areas and tell them, okay, if you don't buy this thing, I'm, I'm, I'm going to leave. And for example, take a poultry farmer that has maybe a thousand broilers, you know, the moment the broilers is up to the age of, uh, of taking and nobody's buying his money, he keeps spending money and, uh, and he, that's chopping into his profit. So platforms like that, farmers are able to show, oh, I've, I have uh, 1,000 broilers that are table size, maybe 2 kg, 1 kg, and other farmers that have customers which do not have product are able to connect their customers to other farmers. So those are, those are possible ways that online has been able, online platforms has been able to uh, empower local partners. Thank you. And thanks for highlighting, you know, the challenges that also come with online platforms. So we often see them as, you know, the the greatest thing in terms of uh, empowering folks. But, you know, with that comes empowering other actors as well. And so still highlight some of the, the challenges and how we can overcome, uh, you know, the the back and forth between use of online platforms. Uh, Kirsten, did you want to say something? Yeah, sure. No, I just wanted to mention um, when we're talking about online platforms that really empower people, um, I think we should give a shout out to NASA um, and the Earth Science uh, Applied Sciences Group. Um, they have the uh, Applied Remote Sensing Training Program, RSET, um, that provides trainings online from, you know, intro level all the way up to very sophisticated trainings that um, you know, when, when I think of data needs, I'm a data person. So when I think of um, empowering people, I think, you know, how can we help people use data? And this is one of my favorite resources um, and platforms and communities online um, that, that really puts um, the power to access and use data and information into directly into people's hands. Um, so I just wanted to, to throw that in there. Excellent. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, sort of going along that that thread in sort of a favorite service or or um, you know group supporting that. I was wondering if the other panelists would have uh, a platform or a, a group that is supporting an online platform that uh, you would highlight. Um, would start with uh, Catherine. Group that is. Uh supporting an online platform. I, I, I can speak to, I guess my, you know, just specifically with uh, with our work, it's more like using an online platform to, to coordinate and communicate with, um, uh, with extension agents, for example. Um, I, this has been already mentioned, uh, the explosion in WhatsApp, I found it incredibly practical in many ways because we don't need to set up any external crazy infrastructure for when we're connecting with a, 
a new team. Um, and on my phone, I have uh, groups from, <laughs> from Mali, from Tanzania, from Kenya, from Uganda, from Rwanda. And sometimes it's, you know, just a simple exchange about, um, you know, any updates generally, but sometimes it is when we want to verify something. So if we uh, uh, have a good example from, there was some floods in, um, in Kenya, I think it was in 2019, and the extension agents had, you know, photographs that represented what exactly was going on. So we could see, you know, there's extensive flooding from the satellite data, but, um, the level of you know the impact is, is not it's not the same when you're looking at a map and when you're looking at a photograph so if you look at a photograph and you can see how much larger the area that's impacted is it's um you know it's it's the message gets home and so using whatsapp has made it pretty easy some of the other things we use it for which a lot of people might not know um, when we're coordinating um, submissions, for example, to the crop monitors. Um, a good example is the one for Kenya, where um, you know, the lead coordinator in, in the Ministry of Ag reaches out for people to only not only submit uh, assessments, but then also provide evidence of why they've assessed something that way. And it's, it's, it's kind of easy because you reach people from a, a very large uh, geographic spread. Um, which would be very different. And, and we can send, of course, images, photographs, videos, which you wouldn't be able to do with simple text messages. And, um, and most people, not most people, a lot of people know how to use uh, the platform. So that makes it uh, really interesting. One of the examples when we were kind of thinking about the session that I also mentioned, there's a newsletter. Um, for some reason, I can't think of the name right now. Um, <laughs> But it is the main method of sending it out is through WhatsApp. It's called the continent. I remember the name. And um, I like this example because the reach is just incredible. Um, and the way the information is packaged, it's very easy to read on a phone. And you know, it goes back to kind of my original point about packaging, simplicity, uh, being aware of that. You know, these sometimes there are these websites where you have to scroll all the way to the right to see a sentence, and then you have to come back all the way to the left to see the beginning of the next one. So those types of things uh, um, don't work. And so if you're putting it together a newsletter, um, you know, that's one another way of, of, uh, of doing that. Um, and then one of the other ones we use, of course, for, for ground data collection, is ODK, it's open data kit, it's an open platform, you can set up your forms and collect data. So I like that too, because we don't need to make, uh, you know, any initial investments, like set up our own system, we can leverage this open source tool. Um, and there's ownership, like the end user can own it, uh, we don't have to own it. And that's, you know, an incredibly uh, positive uh, thing. Thanks. Um, next, uh, <laughs> Ekenik Pong, uh, your thoughts on a, a platform that you would recommend? Yeah, we, we starting from our own platform, our in-house platform, you know, uh, we have uh, like an IVR, that's Interactive Voice Response Platform, uh, which basically support farmers in the rural areas. We, we launched us about two years ago and uh, uh, because of the multilingual uh, ways that Nigeria is, we have different languages uh, spread across the whole country. So we've developed for three languages and uh, it's quite interesting to note that farmers are uh, accepting, they're really accepting and embracing the technology. It's a simple uh, phone number, just like you're dialing your wife or your, your friend, your husband. Uh, so we have a phone number out there where you call, once you call, it, it has extensions, it has different extensions, you press one, uh, it, it helps you talk to an extension agent, you press two, it reads you to an input supplier, you press three, it reads you to uh, maybe a, a vet doctor in case of a livestock farmer, you press four, maybe you need information regarding weather, you know, to know whether it's going to rain or it's, uh, whatsoever it's going to happen the next day, it gives you that guidance. 
So if you, if you need training and more information, you press five. So just with your phone, the way you call your, your friend and uh, the way you call your, your relative, just call that number if you have any issues. Maybe there's an outbreak in your farm. Once you press, you call the number, you press to, it reads to a veterinary doctor who you speak to in real time, real time. So the veterinary doctor will be able to provide an immediate uh, or, or a, a solution to you while waiting for you, while waiting for him to uh, maybe come to your farm. So it's been, it's been quite uh, awesome. It's been quite uh, interesting where uh, farmers are giving us positive feedback that is helping them. You know, it's not free. They pay a token, just like you dialing a, a particular number. So you pay, then the service providers also uh, get a little commission on it. So at the end of the day, it, it, it's a win-win for all the players. Then that's on one part. We also have a, a platform we call Farmers Information and Enterprise Management System, FIMS. Uh, it happens to be the first management information system platform for the cultural sector in Nigeria, which uh, aim is to provide quality data at farm level that can inform risk assessment and help stakeholders properly segment and target smallholder farmers. So uh, with this presently, we have over 280,000 farmers that has been enumerated, you know, through enumeration, we collect their data and we also have a, a management information system where farmers, for example, if, you, if you're planting maize, today that is the ninth and maize is three months uh, interval, this March, April, May, June. So by 9th of June or so, we know that okay, farmer X has will have a, a harvest depending on the your your hectare that you cultivated. For example, we are taking maize. For example, if uh, five, if one hectare of maize of uh, maize field yield uh, five tons and you did ten, so that's going to be five times ten. We now know okay, this farmer is expecting to have this yield. So uh, it's 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 quite it's quite a, a welcoming platform that we are we've we've launched out there. It's supporting farmers, also supporting service providers to bring them together and uh, avoid uh, losses, post harvest losses, and also uh, uh, market issues with aggregators. So those are the platforms, and uh, that's for what we've developed. But I spoke extensively on WhatsApp and other. Uh, small, small platforms, but when you're looking at most of the farmers in the rural areas, they're not on smartphones. So we've developed uh, tools and platforms that will, will be able to still reach out to them to solve the same problem that in a way WhatsApp and uh, mobile apps and the rest to do. So uh, that's what we are we, we're looking at now. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Jean-Claude, could you give a, a brief highlight on a platform that you would recommend um, so we can then move on to Q&A with the, the audience. OK, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Zachary. So yes, uh, in our case, as we, we don't have any we developed on our own except on climate, uh, digital agricultural climate information, which we share with the people on information, which variety to plant. and. So, but that's one again, it goes through WhatsApp group and, and also bulk SMS and uh, we have also Telegram. But, but among all this, uh, we've tried to our bigger community because as I said, we have uh, closer to uh, 500 partners. So WhatsApp looks very, very handy uh, because it, it's very flexible. It allows the photos, it allows the small videos. Most of our farmers don't have, maybe some may not have uh, uh, reading skills, but it image, capture all that's at their attention. So for us, really, video has also come, but this video can be loaded on, uh, uh, on as well on, uh, on, on WhatsApp groups in order to reach a wider audience. What we found also within the probably the professionals teams looks very good as well for us. So all these two, uh, both professionals and also for the local communities, the farmers where the WhatsApp is very important. You can load several technical, non-technical, simple. So and sometimes the phones are not that complicated to accommodate that. So they are easy as well. But also one thing I must say is that uh, all, all this as well, they cannot replace the physical. Physical remains still very important because during, during breaks, you have always interact and reach. They're very complementary. So that's what I can say. But what, and then I also think really the WhatsApp 
it's far better in terms of reaching the communities because of the photos that people like image you seeing it's it's a believing so that's very important as well yeah okay thank you um many uh pointing to uh, WhatsApp as a, a useful tool in terms of communicating at uh, the local level with uh, a variety of stakeholders, um, you know, to, to help share information. So with that, I'm kind of starting with some of the questions from the audience. Uh, Alana McKinney had a question around what's the biggest challenge to measuring and demonstrating the impact that platforms have on locally led development. Um, this is kind of a really ongoing question is, as you use these online platforms, how do we understand whether or not they're having the intended impact in terms of knowledge sharing? Uh, you know, start that out with perhaps, um, uh, Ekin, Ekin, sorry, Ekin, uh, Ekin, <laughs> my apologies uh, with yeah. you how do you um measure the the biggest challenges to uh measuring um the impact of the work that you're doing uh yeah yeah the the, the biggest challenge is uh the cost of data you know data is quite expensive in uh, this part of the world and uh for you to roll out maybe like two megabytes for you to even download a mobile app that has between 20 to 40 megabytes uh, that's that's a lot of money you know and uh, also challenge around the uh, challenge around uh, uh, power supply you know charging your phone you know you see lots of farmers going around with uh, power banks and maybe solar to see how to power their phone because of a lack of electricity that's also another challenge uh, but above all the biggest challenge that farmers are actually facing uh, from our own platform, speaking from uh, our own uh, in-house now, is the cost, the cost of, of maintaining these platforms. On the farmer side, the cost of calling, you, you call, you know, for example, if you are calling an IVR, you, you need to wait to listen to the, the machine speak, tell you, okay, if you want to speak to a service provider, press one, if you want to speak to a vet doctor, press two, if you want to speak to uh, uh, maybe an extension agent, press three, that's time going and that's money also going. For a smallholder farmer, that might be a, a whole lot for him. So the kind of, man, if, if what's, what, what's the alternative for, for, for getting, uh, for getting over this. So, so that's basically the cost, the cost of digital platforms, the cost of phones. If a, if a farmer misses his or her phones, how long will it take a farmer to replace that phone? If a, a farmer has a data, what will he prioritize? If he has a, 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 if he has a value in his phone to make calls, what is his priority? Is it to call an extension agent or to call a family member or to call a medical doctor if the son or the daughter is ill? So those are the major challenges, electricity, cost of the tariffs and the rest. Those are the major challenges that uh, uh, we are facing around here as regards uh, uh, platforms. Thanks. Um any other thoughts from the panel on in terms of kind of measuring the the impact of of the online of use of online platforms? Um, it was noted the the challenges in just allowing and accessing the the online pl platforms, but thinking also in terms of measuring the the impact of it. Uh, how do you know that it's it's delivering for you? Any quick thoughts? I think this is yeah. a, oh, sorry, Kirsten. Go ahead, please. I was going to say I think it's a, a a really important you know measuring impact is a really important thing. One of the things that you might find sometimes is people just count how many people clicked on something uh, as being outreach, but it it is not necessarily that. So there are some really smart things like how long a person spent on a page, for example, um, you know, could be, maybe they did actually, actually in fact, read what was in the, what was in the article or did they click on the additional link? So there are like some really smart, if you're looking at a newsletter to kind of um, understand people's interaction with the information. Um, but in terms of, you know, particularly with the, the, the work uh, that we do, how we measure impact, you know, could be something that is not measured in clicks or uh, opening information. It is measured in 
um, something that might be an outcome many years later, or something that might be um, measured by engagement uh, or people people's ease of using additional tools uh, later on, or it could be just the case for like with the groups that we coordinate within the ministries is how frequently they publish a, 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 an, a, an article or a, a, pub, a bulletin based on information that we train them on, you know, and how much interaction. I think those, those things are really important uh, to measure. And I think it of course requires, it is our responsibility to be to communicate fairly that clicks and downloads does not necessarily equal impact and um you know we have to have you know a little bit more tangible um more tangible things for example maybe i could also add um, moderator um i, sure. I think yeah, we probably have to go beyond to complement what uh, Catherine was talking about. We probably need also to go beyond the usage of what we do, what we deliver, but how does it change in terms of outcome, in terms of livelihood, in terms of incomes? Are this message having an impact on the farmer, on the value chain actors, on entrepreneurs? Are they, as we said, now you can source your material easily, you can look at the price and you can make selections, you can inform the choice. So beyond that, so we need also to think, how do we, how that's impact their livelihood? How does it change? And what we're able to do, it's again, using that platform and send, we have been able to send the surveys, quick surveys, and you can, uh, they say in each country we work in, many they have uh, WhatsApp groups. So you can easily use that WhatsApp groups and, and put up a questionnaire and people will answer and then you get a feedback. Uh, of course, you don't have to complicate it, make it simple and people provide you a feedback. If that information uh, helps them in their day-to-day -day life as a trader, as a farmer who gets uh, access to information on variety, uh, as an extension officer who gets information which we're not getting before, so how useful it so that you improve. So yeah, the feedback, the two directional or bi-directional uh, also interactions happens as well through these platforms, which were not there before, or which were very complicated to get before this in place. Well, thank you. Um, recognizing that, uh, you know, trying to be a good steward of time and knowing that uh, the next session will be starting soon. Uh, I wanted to take an opportunity to thank our panelists today for joining and sort of sharing their experiences and uh, their thoughts on the use of online platforms for uh, locally led development. Um, I want to note that uh, we will be looking to uh, answer the, the questions that, you know, the rich discussion that was going on in the chat uh, via uh, Hoover uh, for as part of the, the ongoing ICT for Ag and try to capture some of those there. So folks who are participating today, please check there for, um, for answers to your questions. Um, and I really want to thank uh, all of you who are participating in this, uh, for you taking the time, for sharing your questions, um, for engaging in the discussion and sort of sharing your experiences. Uh, my name is Zachary Bakke, and I thank you very much for your participation. And again, thank you for our speakers, uh, panelists, for uh, joining us today.